If I told you to imagine zero gravity, would it by any chance be something that looks like this? What you have seen are in fact astronauts who are experiencing zero G, which means zero gravity, zero and G gravity, right? Not really. It means zero G force and G force is a measurement of an object's acceleration against a particular surface in such a way that makes it have weight. Now that's not the only thing that makes zero gravity not really be zero gravity. By the end of this video, you're going to find that finding zero gravity is an almost impossible task. First of all, let's tackle this zero G situation. If you were to jump off a cliff, please do not jump off a cliff. That will probably result in you dying. But let's imagine that you do jump off a cliff, then your total velocity after one second is going to be 9.8 meters per second. And after one second, that velocity is going to increase to 9.8 meters per second plus 9.8 meters per second. And every second, this total velocity increases by 9.8 meters per second, giving you a total acceleration value of 9.8 meters per second per second. Now you might think that you are not falling when you are standing on the surface of the earth, but you are in fact falling at a rate of 9.8 meters per second per second. However, what is blocking your way is the surface of the earth. So as a result of earth attempting to pull you down at a rate of 9.8 meters per second per second, and its surface blocking your way, you end up feeling this mutual push between yourself and the surface of the earth. Now, Earth's gravity is mostly responsible for this push that you feel between yourself and its surface, this value of 9.8 meters per second per second. However, there are other factors. For example, Earth's rotation. If you were to stand somewhere near the equator, there is acceleration in the opposite direction, making you weigh slightly less than that if you were to stand somewhere near the poles. This is also applicable to other bodies in space. However, I emphasize once more that the gravity of whatever it is that you're standing on would be the one mostly responsible for this push that you would feel between yourself and the surface of this object. For example, if you were to stand on the surface of the moon, an object that has less mass than that of the Earth and has around the same density than that of the Earth, density is also important, it's not just mass, then as a result, it has less gravitational influence than that of the Earth. And that would mean you would feel less acceleration against the surface of the moon, specifically one sixth that of whatever it is that you would feel on the surface of the earth. And that means you would weigh one sixth that of whatever it is that you would weigh on the surface of the earth. But let's say that you stand on the surface of something that has much more mass than that of the earth compacted in a much smaller area. Say for example, the surface of a neutron star. Now, to be clear here, you can't really actually stand on the surface of the star because this star would kill you way before you get to its surface. Why? Because the acceleration you would feel as you're approaching this star would be so much that the closest part of your body to this star would get stretched out so much way before the part that is further away from this star. So it, you would end up like a piece of spaghetti. Assuming you are able to stand on the surface of this star, then the acceleration you would feel towards the center of the star is so much, you would feel around this many Gs. You see, you can change the value of this push that you feel between yourself and a particular surface depending on how exactly you are in contact with this surface. Let's go back to the astronauts that we've seen in the beginning part of this video. They are in the International Space Station. How did they get to the International Space Station? They've probably had to get there with some kind of a space contraption, specifically this contraption. During their trip, these astronauts experience different levels of G depending on which part of the trip they are currently experiencing. And that depends on what kind of acceleration they are feeling. At a particular point, they end up experiencing 3.5 Gs, which is 3.5 times higher than the normal 1 G they would feel against the surface of the Earth. Except, in this particular case, they are not feeling the push between themselves and the surface of the Earth. They are feeling a push between themselves and their seats. 
Now what is happening here is a fight between the Earth attempting to pull the rocket back down to the surface and the rocket accelerating away from the Earth, giving you a combined acceleration value that the astronauts feel which is higher than the usual 1G acceleration that you would feel against the surface of the Earth, which is 9.8 meters per second per second. You have to be careful here, however, you can't just add the acceleration value of the rocket to that of the acceleration value that you would feel due to Earth's gravity and just call it a day. Why? Because direction is just as important as the value of acceleration. This is the trail left by one of the rockets going to the International Space Station and you can see that it's not exactly a vertical line, it's a sideways kind of line. If you want to find more about the values of G that astronauts experience during their trip to the International Space Station, I highly recommend that you watch this video created by the European Space Agency. Once these astronauts finally reach the International Space Station and start enjoying some space sushi, they no longer feel any particular push against any particular surface. And as a result of them not feeling a push against a surface, they are experiencing zero G, zero G force, which is why they appear to be weightless. The reason they are able to achieve that is because they and the International Space Station are constantly falling around the Earth, continuously falling without being pushed against any surface. Now they do have to accelerate away from the Earth every now and again, but aside from that, for the most part, they are experiencing zero G. You can even achieve the state of weightlessness inside an object that has more gravitational influence than anything else in the universe, and there is a supermassive black hole. You can pass the event horizon of a supermassive black hole, the point where nothing can escape, even light, and you would still not feel any particular push against any particular surface in any particular direction. Now to be clear here, it has to be a supermassive black hole because the singularity of a supermassive black hole is far enough away from the event horizon that you could safely pass the event horizon without getting spaghettified. If it was a small black hole, you would feel, you know, being spaghettified. Now the thing is, and you might have noticed this, the International Space Station is still orbiting the Earth. Why? Because it's bound to it gravitationally, if the International Space Station was in fact experiencing zero gravity, then it would just fly off away from Earth. Earth itself would disintegrate, the solar system wouldn't really be a solar system anymore, and the galaxy, well, it wouldn't be a galaxy. But it turns out you can't even say that there is zero gravity, because zero gravity doesn't seem to be something that exists. To show you why this is the case, let's start with the International Space Station itself. At an altitude of 400 kilometers, an altitude that the International Space Station is sometimes at, as it is orbiting the Earth, Earth's gravity is still 90% as strong as it is on Earth's surface. At about 12,500 kilometers, Earth's gravity is 25% as strong as it is here on the surface. Double that. 25,000 kilometers, it's around 6.25%. 50,000 kilometers, it's around 1.5%. It never quite reaches zero. However, there is a small problem with what I have just mentioned. In classical physics, Newtonian physics, if there was a change in the gravitational influence of an object, then this change happens across the entirety of the universe in an instant. In the more accurate description of gravity, which comes as part of Einstein's theory of general relativity, this is not the case. General relativity replaces the static space used by classical physics and brings in the much more flexible fabric of space-time. And this fabric is absolutely essential in order for gravity to be gravity. Let's imagine that this fabric represents the fabric of space-time. If I place something that has a lot of mass in it, then it's going to curve this fabric very heavily. And if I throw some other objects in there that don't really have as much mass as the first object, then they're going to start orbiting this object because of the way it's curving this fabric. Other objects are also curving this fabric in their own way, but it's much less than that than the first object. 
Now, let me just clarify a few things about this analogy fabric because we will be using it a bit more. First of all, the actual fabric of space-time is not a two-dimensional sheet like this analogy fabric. It's more of a four-dimensional thing, three dimensions of space and one dimension of time, hence the fabric of space-time. But it's unbelievably difficult to visualize something like that. That is why usually it is depicted as a two-dimensional sheet like this analogy fabric. Second of all, you're noticing that these supposed planetary bodies, their orbits are decaying very quickly and they are crashing into the object that is causing the highest amount of curvature in this fabric. In the actual fabric of space-time, this is not the case. Why? Because in this analogy fabric, these supposed planetary bodies are losing energy due to their friction with the fabric. In the actual fabric of space-time, there is almost no friction. With that said, here is another difference between classical physics definition of gravity and that of general relativity. In classical physics, the source of gravity is the mass of an object. However, in Einstein's theory of general relativity, it's the uneven distribution of energy. And because of Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared, we know that mass isn't itself responsible for the curvature of the fabric of space-time. It is the energy content of this mass. Even massless particles, say like photons for example, might actually curve the fabric of space-time because while they do not possess mass, they do still possess energy in the form of momentum and that can create curvature in the fabric of space-time. Although it would be so small, it is essentially impossible to detect. If our sun suddenly disappeared from our solar system, in classical physics, its gravitational influence also suddenly disappears on other objects in the universe. However, in Einstein's theory of general relativity, it takes some time for the curvature created by our sun to go away. In our analogy fabric, if I remove the object that is creating the highest amount of curvature, you can see that the fabric doesn't just change instantly. It takes some time for it to go back to, well, normal. The most recent evidence shows that changes in the curvature of the fabric of space-time happen at the speed of light. They've managed to find this by detecting massive gravitational waves that were created by objects that curved the fabric of space-time by an immense amount, and that is two black holes merging with each other. You can imagine these waves to be something like this happening in our analogy fabric. Now, with all of that said, we can finally discuss why it is essentially impossible to find actual zero gravity. From my own point of view, let's say that I'm an astronaut falling constantly around the Earth, I could probably say that there is no gravity because from my own point of view, I'm not feeling it. But once you start viewing the entire universe, the story is different. Let's imagine that this analogy fabric represents the entire universe and whatever is causing the curvature in this fabric is the energy that is in our universe. Here is the challenge for you. Remove the curvature. Go ahead. Not easy, is it? The most obvious way to do it is to, of course, remove the thing that is causing curvature in the fabric of space-time. The problem is, the thing that is causing curvature in the fabric of space-time is energy. And saying that you need to remove energy from the universe to achieve zero gravity makes no sense. However, there is a way to get a close approximation to what zero gravity might actually be. We don't really have to remove the energy in the universe to remove the curvature that this energy creates. What we can do is take this energy and then spread it out extremely uniformly across the fabric. What this would do is take the curvature that is caused by this energy and spread it out so much that the fabric becomes incredibly smooth to the point where if you look at it from top, you would see just a smooth fabric. There is nothing wrong with it. But can you actually do it? In reality, can you find a way to spread this energy extremely uniformly across the entire universe? It turns out we don't really have to do that. Our universe is in fact doing this as we speak. In fact, our universe may have found a much better way of doing this without actually touching the energy in the universe itself. It is making the fabric of space-time larger and larger over time. This is the accelerating expansion of the universe which is hypothesized to be caused 
by a form of energy called dark energy a form of energy which it itself is extremely uniformly spread across the entire universe which probably is why it's not really causing any curvature in the fabric of space-time in our analogy fabric that would be the equivalent of me taking this fabric and just keep stretching it forever at a really really far point in the future if I were to look at the entirety of this fabric it will be almost impossible for me to detect any kind of curvature in this fabric when compared to my earlier point of view our universe is going to reach a similar state around the Google years from now once all supermassive black holes have evaporated and assuming that protons do decay over time that point in time is probably the closest we will have to something resembling zero gravity however what do you think is there zero gravity and if there is zero gravity where is it thank you very much and i'll see you next time